What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD mode interview where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs and just strip top badasses. You guys are out there dominating their spaces of people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create epic, big, amazing lives for themselves and for their families. So today, you guys, we had a great guest on the show today. It's actually a personal friend of mine um, that's uh, uh, kicking massive ass up in Vegas, dude. This guy's an entrepreneur, a real estate broker, real estate agent, does a lot of uh, investments, flips. It, it got a lot going on. So really stoked and honored to have Brian Nyes on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, me too, man. You, you, got, a, you got a pretty unique journey and a pretty unique story, man, that... Uh, you know, that uh, is, is brought you to where you are today. So I'm excited to get deep into this. And, and you know, we have a lot of realtors there on the show, um, but you kind of take a, di a, a different path than a lot have, right? I mean, most realtors that we have on the show kind of built their business through the traditional methods. And, and you've done a lot. You, you, you've, not that you don't do traditional business, but you've just done it differently than a lot. So I'm really excited to kind of share your success stories there. But before we jump into that, dude, I'm kind of interested to just kind of get an idea of like what led you into this path the, the first place. I know we've known each other for a long time, but I don't know like like your deep story as far as what led right. you to entrepreneurship in the first place. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know how far you want to go back, but that I think that goes way back to to when I was a you know when I was a child, and and I grew up in Michigan just like you did, and you know what's in Michigan? There's really, I mean, there's you know the best hope that you can do in Michigan is to work for you know GM, Ford, or Chrysler, and and punch a time clock every day. And I saw my dad go through that. He worked for GM for 32 years and just miserable and hated it. So early on, I, I always thought of, I, I, I just, this isn't the right place for me. I had a great childhood and growing up there, but I knew early on that this just wasn't the place for me. There wasn't really opportunity. And growing up in a single family household, I was always kind of, you know, having to find my way on my own. So it's kind of teaching me a little bit about entrepreneurship right off the bat, you know, at, at an early age. And, and so I, I think that's really where it started for me is I've always, always like striving for something better. And so getting out of Michigan was was my main objective when I was a kid. And I ended up doing that in, in my teenage years. I traveled around with a uh, traveling sales company just to get out of the state. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where to go. And I'm like, I just need to get out of here. I'm like, I'm a beach bum trapped in, you know, near Detroit. <laughs> There's no beach. I mean, we have lakes and all that, but I wanted the ocean. I mean, I, I was just really, really wanted, just, just really craving to get out of that environment because I saw what was the writing on the wall there and, and that just wasn't for me. And so that's really what led me into, you know, my life of entrepreneurship is, is doing that and traveling around a little bit, seeing what else was out there. And, and once I saw that, it was all over with. I'm like, I, I the, and then I came back to Michigan and made plans about getting out of there and uh, decided to move to Vegas at that time. So, so traveling sales as a teenager, was this like, a, um, I don't know, was this like a program that you jumped into in high school? Or was this like as soon as high school was done? You, you like Talk to us about that, dude. Yeah, exactly. When, as soon as high school was done, you know, all, all my friends, everybody's like swapping girlfriends. And it's just, I'm just like, I, I got to get out of here. <laughs> no offense to Michigan because I had a great childhood there. But, but it was really just like, you know, I just had enough. So I opened up the paper one day and I saw an ad that says California bound. Oh, oh that's me. You know, uh, you know, sales, California bound. That's all I needed to hear. And I was in. I met with the leader of that organization at a, like the, the, the Ferndale Hilton or something like that. I don't even know where I was. But and they signed me on. It was like it was one of those magazine sales things where they put all these kids in a van and they take them out to neighborhoods. And they knock on doors. And you want to talk about, you know, learning uh, rejection at an early age, man, that really set me up for, for being able to put myself out there and, and, and not worry about what it looks like and, 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 and learning about rejection at an early age. Yeah. So that's, that's what it was. And it took me from state to state all around the country. And I actually got to see a lot of the country through doing this process. And, you know, it's not something that, you know, that I'm proud of, but it was something that was an experience that was really, for me, it was, it was really key in, in, in growing and learning what I was wanting to do. And, and I knew that that was it for me. Yeah, no, that's epic, dude, because like you said, you, you got to see the rest of the country. But then, man, uh, you know, I mean, you and I were, were you know, do some masterminding together. And, and, you know, and then the fear that people have of rejection, man, you know, it just got it. It can just, um, I mean, you and I see it just allow people to break their whole entire careers and their success just from, from allowing that fear to win and, you know, it helped you overcome that at an early age, right? So then you go back to Michigan, dude, and you have plans then to leave Michigan. Um, I mean, from there, did you set those plans? Did you jump right into real estate in Vegas and I brought you to Vegas, but did you 
you know, jump right away into real estate? No, actually, when I got to Vegas, you know, I, I, I didn't really have a plan. We just said, let's just go. I, I, you know, I hooked up with a buddy of mine and we both just decided, let's just get out of here and go. Packed up a, a van with a 10 by 10 trailer. I had a mattress and two speakers. <laughs> it was really the, the extent of my of my belongings at the time. And we just said, let's just do it because I know if I don't do it now, we're going to get stuck here and I'll never be able to do it. So whether it works or not, let's just do it. Go for it. So we saved up some money, drove out to Vegas, and we got a hotel out here. We just decided to grab an apartment. Got some odds and ends jobs, and, and he ended up moving back to back to Michigan. So I was literally in Vegas by myself. I remember the first Christmas I sent, spent here by myself. I'm sitting at a bar playing video poker, just going, "What am I doing?" You know. And uh, so long story short, is I ended up hooking up with some with some friends and 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 got a a place with them. But I got into the casino industry at that point. So back in 1995, I started working at the Hard Rock. I opened that place and worked there until 2002. And that's really when I learned about myself and learned that I'm unemployable. Yeah. I, I can't do this. Right. I mean, seven years in a casino, the first four years were awesome. I was in my mid 20s making, you know, 60, 70 a year. No, no bills, no responsibilities, you know, in Vegas. And it was it was a great time. But I learned, you know, those last three years were so painful for me. Just swiping that clock, you know, five days a week and, and just absolutely hating it. And I knew right then and there, I'm like, I'm not getting on the hamster wheel ever again. And that's when I jumped into, you know, entrepreneurship and, and I've had several businesses from that point, um, owned a fitness equipment company, uh, was in entertainment. We were going to bring, you know, Lucha Libre, AAA wrestling to the United States and try to take on WWE and WWF. And I mean, there's a huge market for that, but it just didn't end up happening. You know, partnerships are massive. And, and those things really taught me that it's not just about the plans that you have, but it's also about the partners that you have in with you. You know, as you as as you know. Yeah, yeah, it is, man. I mean, I've had some great partnerships. I've had some failed partnerships, but uh, um, it, yeah, it, it's a whole different intricate element. Um, well, anyway, I think that's married. Kind of knows, you know, it's like business partnership, just like a marriage, right? You want to have a great, successful marriage. I mean, you gotta gotta kind of get that that right, you know. Um, so then, what what then, dude? Because like fitness equipment. WWE, you know, like whatever, and then real estate. Like, like what, what led you into real estate, bro? Yeah, I really don't know. I think, you know, working at the Hard Rock, uh, that's where I met my wife. We ended up getting married, you know, shortly after we met at the Hard Rock. And we were both stuck in this job that we hated. And I said, you know what? I'll stay here. We have the benefits. Let me get you out of here first. So we got her out. She jumped into real estate back in uh, back in 2000. So that's where we were, really where we got our start. We, she started first, built up a base, built up you know her, her business a little bit, and that allowed me to transition out a couple years later. Yep, love it, dude. So then, okay, so you you jump into real estate, right? Now you've got your sales experiences that you've had. You you've got uh, you know um, the other business ventures that you did. I don't want to say they were they were failed. They just were a path that you chose to not take any longer. You jump into this. Um, walk us through walk us through what you did from when you guys. I know your wife kind of was in the space and got a jump start for you guys. Um, but dude, we're in an industry with ninety percent of agents failing in the first three years. And then, as as you know, dude, I mean, even those that make it, like after three years, even those that make it, they struggle so heavily for. And I think this is all entrepreneurship, not just real estate. Um, but uh, like ninety three percent would make more work at McDonald's full time. You know, right? It's so, like, what did you do initially? Because you also jumped in the game. When the market wasn't great, it's not like it is today in 2016, you know, right? Like, what did you do initially to, to create some success um, so you weren't a statistic dropping out of the business? Well, I wrote on my wife's coattails, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know really, to be, just to be honest with you, she's really good at the relationship building and building that business. And, and I just, we created the team together and, and then we had the Nisley team at that point back in like 2003. And, and we did that for, for probably about a year before we realized, you know, we, we're doing the same activities and we're really generating the same amount of business. Why does, why, we, one of us can do this work. And that's when we decided where I would take over the traditional real estate business and she would jump into new home sales. And then she went to work for some of the big builders and that's when the market really started to take off. So, you know, she would basically sit on site and just writing contracts all day and, 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 you know, I would basically you know back in those days it was real estate was so easy so for me it was i was really lucky when i got into the business because it was a, a, a really easy time for real estate it was hard not to sell properties at that point because we our our population doubled in a 10-year period during that time 
So there was a lot of real estate to be sold. Yeah. Okay. So then, so you're, you guys are doing that, right? Um, things are going great. And then the market uh, transitions massively. I mean, I know like Phoenix, Vegas, you know, where you're at and where I'm at. I mean, they're like the two or, or I mean, definitely in the top five hardest hit places in the, in the nation. You know, and I know you transitioned very well into the investment side. Did you did you transition into the investments and flips before the market crash or did that happen? Like at what point did you kind of transition heavily into that? That happened after. And that was another really hard lesson that we had to, my wife and I had to learn was, you know, going through 2004 and 2005 and 2006, both of us being in real estate in one of the biggest booms that, you know, that the country in Vegas has ever seen. I mean, we were up well over $300 a foot you know, for, for Vegas homes at that time. And it was just crazy. And the, the amount of appreciation and everything, and we, we just thought this is never going to end. And, you know, the checks just kept rolling in with her sitting on site with, with the builders and just selling massive amounts of homes. It was just easy. And we, we didn't realize what we got ourselves into. And that's when we started, you know, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses which for me was probably one of the best experiences I ever had was, was going through that and then losing it all. Yeah. Because without doing that, like you say all the time, without doing that, you don't know. And, and from that point forward, it's like, I'm never going to put myself in that position again. And so, you know, again, even with, with, with my businesses and with, with my real estate business and all of that, failing your way to success is, is just, you just got to keep pushing forward. And those were really hard life lessons. And that was really hard to recover from after 2006 because the market just fell off the cliff, you know, and yeah. just like just like your market did. And and that's when we really had to start reinventing ourselves. And, and um, my wife got out of the business. I went into the lending side of the business for a while just to learn that aspect because I didn't really know enough about it. And then I, I you know, I, I started a couple more businesses, but long story short is, is I ended up working for a couple private capital groups, getting back into the real estate side. We were developing uh, platforms for buying non-performing notes and chasing REO pools and doing all that stuff and ended up being, you know, just there's so many people that were in that game at that time that were looking for that one big score where you're going to take down 100 homes from, from the bank. And it just didn't happen. You know, we had real capital behind us. But that's when we got uh, introduced to the auction platform. The trustee sale auction here in Vegas is when we were trying to go after these non-performing no pools and REO, uh, you know, dealing with these you know, these mandates and buyer reps and NCNDs and NDAs. And it's just a bunch of garbage, a waste of, of several months. But it led us to the auction, which was really key for um, myself and my partner. And this is where I met my partner um, working for these private capital groups. We spent probably 14 hours a day developing an auction platform for buying properties at the auction because we saw the opportunity there and we did that for probably a good seven or eight months buying for a a, a private capital group at the auction they decided to to basically pull the rug out from under us and send us in a new direction and that's when my partner and i decided to start paragon asset management group which is my asset management company and we started our own because we said listen we're we've developed we've designed we've we've implemented this whole entire process these guys are just the money behind it let's go out start our own asset management company find the money ourselves and do this ourselves and that was a another hard lesson because we had an investor that was backing us that said, hey, we'll back you guys on this. They pulled out at the last minute. We left, created our company, and now we're starting again from square one. Ground zero, once again, <laughs> no money backing us. We got a company, we have a concept, now we need the money. That taught us a real great lesson in how to go out and raise money. And that's when we got our start in the auction platform. Yeah, dude. So, so before we kind of talk about how you got the money and turned that around, and then you know, obviously took it from from that point to where you're at right now, um, like during this time, dude, like what what keeps you pushing and going at this point? Because I think that this is something that a lot of um, people don't think about or consider when they get into entrepreneurship. But when we really break this down, I mean, you've been at the game for a lot of years at this point. And it's, you know, it, where you're always having to reinvent yourself. And, and, you know, at this point, I mean, most people are like, just like, screw it, dude. I'm just going to go back to corporate America at this point. Like, you know, because they do. You get to that point where you're like, shit, man, I'm on my eighth deal. And yeah. it's like it's like every time we think we're going to make it, that rug gets pulled out. And like, like what kept you driving at that point and not giving up when you know what have broken like 99% of people at this point? I guess, it's, you know, it was deep inside of me. 
You know, I don't know how many times, you know, it's funny you say that. Why don't you just go back to the hamster wheel? Because that's what my wife said to me so many times. She's like, just go get a freaking job. And I'm like, I don't want a job. I can't do that. I've been there. I've done that. I'm, if you want to have a husband that's miserable and I come home every day and just absolutely miserable, then I'll go do that. But I just refuse to, to, to give up and succumb to that because I know that I'm going to spend a life of being miserable. So I'm going to keep pushing through. And, you know, I have, I'm in my home office right now because of the holidays, but I have this behind me to remind me of my family. My family is just, just everything to me. I have two boys and my wife and, you know, I've been married for, for 18 years now and, and my boys are starting to grow up and that's what pushes me right there. I know that, that there's, there's got to be something more to leave as a legacy for my kids than just me going to get a job. So that's really what pushes me. And, and, and you know, I've, what's the worst that can happen? And that's what I tell myself all the time. It's like you've fallen down 16 times already. You pick yourself back up and you're ready to go again. So why, you know, what's going to be any different this time? The next time it's going to be, you know, it's just going to be that continual growth curve year after year growth. And, and that's what I keep pushing for because I know it's coming. Yep. Yeah, dude, I think too that, and I don't know if you, you agree with this or not, but I always look at this like, even if I don't like truly make it on a financial level to like leave a legacy for my kids, like I want my kids seeing me grinding for my passion so they never settle for the good enough, man. Like even if I never make it, I don't want them to like see, like, because your kids do what we do, right? right so right. just that, that push of seeing you chasing your passion, you know, that's, that's a definite driving force internally. Do you feel that too? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I mean about leaving a legacy is just setting that example for my kids and knowing that, you know, daddy's, you know, he's pushing, he's pushing hard every day, you know, and, and, and I look at, at you know, I, I'm trying to model myself after, after people that are there and that doing it, you know, and, and, and hooking up with you, it's, you know, I watch you and what you're doing on a daily basis. I, you know, I look at a lot of other people in this industry that are, that are really pushing hard and doing great things. And that's really what drives me is it's like every time I feel like saying, you know what, I'm tired. I just want to take a break. I listen to you or I listen to Darren Hardy or I listen to, you know, I, I, I watch Greg Daniel. I mean, there's a ton of people out there that are doing stuff every single day and pushing through it. And that's what keeps me going is just thinking about, you know, I, I'll rest later. You know, there's no time for that right now. Yeah, it's hard. It's, I'm not saying it's easy at all. You know that it's 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 hard. And sometimes I look at the stuff that you're doing. I'm like, man, this guy's crazy. I can't keep up with him. But you got me getting up at four o'clock in the morning, going to the gym. I mean, <laughs> I never thought I'd see myself doing that, but you got to get it in. Yeah, no, I love that, man. That's awesome, dude. So, all right, man. So you're you're okay. So now now you guys have re realized um, at this point how to go out there and raise the capital. And the reason that I, I, I want to go um, kind of deep in the processes that you've done with this is like I was just recently interviewed. It hasn't been published yet by Realtor Magazine. Um, about adapting from a traditional market into a distressed market because they see it coming. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, you, you got record all-time high real estate prices. You got record all-time low uh, uh, interest rates. Stock market's record. Like, it's the perfect storm. We all know what happens after, you know, after what we're in right now. Like, we know what's coming. Um, and, and, and there's areas like Vegas and Phoenix where I'm like, well, dude, we're still, I don't know about Vegas, but like Phoenix is still like 35% from 2005 prices. So we still have a lot of weight, but that's not the rest of the country. I mean, most of the country is, you know, so it's inevitable. It's all coming, you know, right? right? And, and I love hearing stories of, of what you, because most people that listen to this right now, they've been in the business, you know, a few years. They, they haven't experienced what you and I have went through, you know, right. right? So this maybe can help people get prepped for like what maybe they can come and how to think out of the box. So, okay, so you guys like, okay, so, so you lost your backing, um, but you got this system, like you know how to do it. Right. But now you got to go find the money and convince people to give you this money. Like, how do you go out there and do that? And then kind of walk us through like what you guys did then once you got that funding to rebuild. You know, you would, you would think that that would be the easy part. Right. You, you found you found a system that works, although, you know, we and we've had success with it already because we had success in the private capital world. And, and now it's, it's now we're taking that platform and making it our own and driving it through Paragon. But that was that was a real wake up call. It's like, man, you, you know, you start we started, you know, reaching out and looking for money and 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 at, at 30 percent return. You know, we're, we get you 30 percent annualized. We get you 40 percent annualized. And that stuff was available. We were we were doing back in those days in a declining market. We were averaging 30, 32 percent annualized return for our investors once we got capitalized. But prior to that, it was still always in money raising mode. And we've quickly realized that 
you can't you can't advertise those those types of returns because people think they're pie in the sky. Even though you have a proven system and you have results behind you, people don't believe that. There's so many there's so many people that have gotten you know uh, taken advantage of or or ripped off and 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 that's when we really realized with with Paragon we really got to have the mindset of looking at this and and for longevity because we're not going anywhere as we know we fail we we get back up and we keep going so we really looked at it as a longevity standpoint it's like we always have to treat it and it sounds like a cliche but we always have to treat our investors money as if it were our own if we wouldn't invest in this with our own money we're not going to use our investors money with that and so having that mindset in in the small money that we actually did raise and we raised it through just basically putting the word out there going on investor meetings and meeting people and and asking other realtors and and reaching out to to uh, other private capital groups and we really just try to blanket everywhere we could to find money and we ended up starting off with a couple of small and mom and pop investors and that's what we got our start from we developed a track record and with that track record now comes more money and it gets a little bit easier to to um to raise money at that point and we started really starting to see we did a uh, I don't know, 150 flips give or take at that point and that's when the market started to change again and now here we go again we got to reinvent ourselves again because now the hedge funds came into town they started buying at the auction their the margins are gone again and now we're reinventing ourselves again so another learning experience for us we were able to though with the mindset of creating this for longevity and always treating our investors money as if our own we created a real good um, um, track record and a real good uh, perception out there in the marketplace and when the hedge funds came to town they were asking some of the operators down there asking title reps and people like that who are the best operators down here at the auction to represent us in these purchases and our name came up several times and we got approached by two separate hedge funds two of the largest in the country and we now have an opportunity to hook up with with the hedge funds one of us wanted to become corporate heads in in um, basically squash our company and go to work for them the other one allowed us to be a vendor of the um, uh, of the hedge fund and work in continuing to grow our Paragon name it was really really difficult to turn down the uh, um, the offer for you know full benefits benefit pension plan you know the whole works a little piece of the entire portfolio you know that was probably the the hardest decision I've ever had to make was turning that down because I knew again I was unemployable Right. I'm not going back into that again. No matter how good that opportunity looks and how, how great it is, we decided to go the other route and thank God we did because that again allowed us to skyrocket out. And we started late 2012 with, with the purchases and there was an operator that was doing it before us um, and they weren't really happy with the results that they were getting. So we came in with my partner is, is extremely good at um, – uh, you know he's a he's a, a a programmer and he's extremely good at developing systems to make us as efficient as we possibly can and with those high volume acquisitions it's extremely important that you're efficient uh, we started in 2012 2013 we were able to close 582 transactions with a team of eight people because we brought everything into uh, a platform where now we can make it as efficient as possible we we did they were doing wet signatures on contracts before we came in. <laughs> like yeah. You guys, you're pumping out 40, 50 contracts a day and you're doing wet signatures. So now what we were, what we were able to do, and it took us several months to get there, but what we were able to do was, was make the process so efficient that we actually had to slow down the acquisitions because the, um, the back end couldn't keep up with the front end. The property management, the renovations, all that stuff were getting backed up and it was a bottleneck. So they would back off on the acquisitions and we just kept going, let's go, 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 go. And, and, you know, so it was a little bit frustrating because I mean, we know we could have closed more transactions, but who's going to complain about 500 and, you know, 80 some transactions in a year. But we, we were able to make it so efficient that it was, you know, the, the, the contract, the, the raw underwriting to the contract submission to the, you know, to the digital signatures, everything was automated. Once we threw the, the, the underwriting into the system, it automatically generated contracts, went into DocuSign, and then came back to us. We sent it to our asset manager, and he sent it out to the agents. 
um, for uh, for submission for the offers. Josh, when I tell you we our our biggest week was 156 offers in one week that we sent out, and we got 45 of them accepted. Yeah. One week. I mean, and so we we just felt like we're on top of the world again. It's like this is just amazing. This is, and we knew this was a short period of time. It was probably a two year window when it happened. Ended up being a year and a half, but two years that again allowed us to now, you know, um, in, in, in it gave personally gave me a lot of recognition in the in the industry, you know, because all of those transactions went through my license. So now I'm getting recruited by other people and lenders and title companies and everybody's noticing me now. And so it really, that was where we stood, decided now we're starting over again because the hedge fund stopped buying. Well, now we, now this is where we transition back into more traditional real estate, going back to the flips, which we just started our platform back up with the flips again. And here we are today, probably doing, uh, I have 16 flips in the works right now. We just started up another fund that's going to allow us to bring in self-directed IRA money, which was going to be huge for us because there's so many people with IRAs out there that are, you know, making two, three percent if they're lucky on their money. And and we partner up with a lot of the investors um, doing a 50-50 split. We we set expectations of 16 to 18 percent. We're delivering 22 percent annualized return right now for investors and we're in money raise mode right now. Yeah, dude. So, all right. So, so you, I mean, you're basically, you're, like I said, you're a 50 50 partner with your investors, but you guys are managing all of it as long as they get the return on their money. Everybody's happy with that. Um, you know, and I've got a lot of follow up questions here. Um, you know, but let's talk about the auctions first, dude. Because I, like, I went down to the auctions, like, you know, I, I got into the flip game for like, I don't know. I mean, it was, if you look at my career, it was a minute, you know, right? For the right. base of my career. And, and it was just one of those processes where, um, I'm too emotional, if you will, right? Like you get down in there, man, you're bidding and, and you got this number in your head and then all of a sudden you're like, oh God, like, I mean, like what, what would, you, just so people are prepped for this, like what are some of like the biggest mistakes? Like if you could boil down to like the top three mistakes that you see people going and bidding at the auctions. Um, so hopefully our listeners might be able to avoid those and have some success. Like, you know, like what do they really need to watch out for in that environment? Because it's a, it's a different world, dude, than I think people are really prepared for. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought that up, Josh, because it, it, you know, I make it sound like, oh, we just go down to the, the auction and buy properties, and it, it couldn't be further from the truth, as you know. Um, there, and and there's, there's a lot of people down there that don't necessarily have your best interest in mind as well, and which is why we're always, you know, going back to the longevity thing is like we make sure that we're always doing that, but there's so much that goes into the auction platform and so much risk if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and it takes a long time to really get your place down at the auction as well, because there's a core group of people down there that have been down there for a long time, including us, you know, because we actually been there for years, but, um, it, it's a difficult process. You know, we have an entire team of people that go through this and we're, we're scrubbing the auction list. We have to pull, um, a title prelims to make sure we know what's recorded against the title. We have to send drivers out there to drive the properties to make sure they're still standing. We know what the condition of the properties are and we can estimate our rehab bids. And you know, so so we're plugging that all into our, our, our platform. And that comes up with, basically it comes up with a bid limit that is going to be our minimum return that we have uh, for each one of our properties. And when you're down there, it's, you know, especially the first couple of times you go down there, you got hundreds of thousands of dollars on your, you know, in your pocket, ready to buy properties with, you know, and cashier's checks. So it's, 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 it's say it's nerve wracking is, is, is an understatement. And yes, you can definitely get caught up in the bidding process and you can get emotional about it. And I would say that that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I people, see people make down there is getting emotional in that bidding process and just continuing to bid past their bid limits. You know, sometimes it's necessary, but other times it's, you know, you really got to stick within those bid, bid limits or you're going to get yourself into trouble. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like gambling at the casino, right? Like, do you, do you feel like your casino experience kind of helped you, like, uh, kind of know how to play that game? Because if you really kind of, if you analyze them, it's, it, there's a lot of similarities, right? 
Yeah, it is. It, you know, I remember the first time I, I dealt dice on a craps table. I was so nervous. I had sweat dripping off my head, and, you know, and after five years of that, and you just throwing the stick around and you're just doing it. So, yeah, it, it, it really was nerve wracking. The first couple of times I bid down there, I was just, I was, you could tell them when I was yelling out my bid, my voice was cracking and everybody's like, who's this newbie in here? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it definitely takes a little while to get used to. That's awesome. So when you talk about, you know, all those things that you just talked about, okay, like, you know, we, we, we get the, we get the property, we got to pull the title report, we got to drive this. I think that, you know, if our listeners aren't familiar with the auction process, this isn't like, you don't have a week to do this stuff. Like you get the list like late the night before or late the night, uh, like before, right? And then you sometimes got to be down there. I don't know if the auction times are the same for you guys, but you got to be down there time bidding early in the morning. So this is kind of a, a crazy process, right? Uh, absolutely. I spend, you know, between me and my partner and our staff, w there's there's like a window of, of 12 hours before the auction start where it's go time. So the night before the auction starts, we have a raw list of properties that we're going after. And that's where I go in and I value all these properties. So I have to look at the after repair value of these properties. And that's that's really where the rubber hits the road because if you get that number wrong, then everything's off. Yeah. You know, so in, in, and that's really difficult. It's taken me years and years and years to get used to that because I also have to study, um, you know, appraiser reports. I have to know what appraisers are thinking, too, because these aren't all cash buys anymore. You know, cash is you know few and far between. And when the cash comes in, they're low ball offers. But um, so the majority of these these deals are conventional FHA, VA. And we got to know what the appraiser's thinking as well. So we know that we can get offers at this price point. But is an appraiser going to back us? And that's difficult these days because appraisers don't have a lot of incentive to push values anymore. I mean, they've got the AMCs in place and all the legislation and everything has passed that really has suppressed that. So we don't go through the 2006, you know, fiasco again. But now I think it's actually hindering our growth as we go through. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a process. Yeah, dude. So when you guys... Um, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but, I mean, you manage the whole process, right? So you're not just acquiring the property you're also managing the crews um to repair them and then managing the sales process so when you're talking about your investors seeing that money i mean that's all said and done you guys are your 50 percent is hey we, we we're structuring the deal and you're pretty much i would say guarantee there's no guarantees in life but you're going to get this return and, and and really for them other than wiring you the money they don't really have a headache in the, the process absolutely and that's one of why a lot of our investors have been with us for many years because they trust us and, and we handle the process from start to finish. Every one of our investors are hands-off investors, they're passive income for them, and they wire the money into, into the account. We pull cashier's checks. We're acquiring the properties. We're managing the rehab process, which that's another um, uh, a really difficult spot that you have to make sure that you manage properly because if you don't have the right team and the right crews on the rehab process, you can get taken. You know. Because uh, I, I I don't know anything about you know rehabbing properties or whether this air conditioner works or not. So you might it, it really need to have partners there, and it's taken us a long time to get the right partners there um, that see the vision of what we're doing and 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 the finishes. And you know once you get on the same page, it gets really easy. But uh, and then managing the rehab process, and then we also going into the marketing and the sell the sale of the property, and then all the way till the close of escrow. So we manage that entire process. And you guys are you guys are getting your investment on average twenty two percent, right? So yes. like like where else on this planet do you, those returns don't exist, dude? Why isn't money just flowing in my? I door? know, yeah. <laughs> but well, like you said though, I mean it, it's one of these things where people have the there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Like we've all you know we've all been taken at some point, and and you know people are skeptical, but you know um, sounds like you guys are still getting some great funding going on, and and yeah, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm very happy with it, and and you know I, it's. It, it, it just it, it's a really great platform and, and we're really proud of it we put a lot of money and a lot of time behind it a lot of resources to getting it right and we've been doing it for what six years now several hundred flips under our belt so uh, you know i'm very very confident with that platform and very happy with where we sit right now now if you have somebody watching this interview right now and and i got a lot more questions for you so i don't want to think that we're we're wrapping up here but i want to drop your your contact info because we've got a lot of entrepreneurs from different fields that are listening right now that they uh, might be looking for a good place to park their money um yeah if you i mean are you are you guys like uh, uh you know syndicating funds if you will like if somebody's like hey man i don't 
I don't have a, I don't have enough money for you to flip a full house for me, Brian. But I got like I got like thirty five grand. Can I put thirty five grand into a bucket and then have you guys you know spread that out? Um, you know, is, is, just give us an idea of what that looks like, and then the best place if somebody is is looking to uh, you know make some money right now, like where's the best place to learn more about you and get in touch with you to to take this to the next level? Yeah, and I appreciate that, Josh. And anybody can reach out to me at info at betterliferealty.com. And uh, I'd be happy to answer. I get a lot of people reaching out to me and, you know, how do I get involved in the flip process? And, you know, I'm not in your state and all this, you know, so I'd be happy to help, you know, answer questions or if anybody's looking forward to get into the process. And there's a lot of realtors out there, too, that have investors and they don't know what to do with them. Yeah. Bring them our way. We'll work with you and, and we'll cut you into, you know, into the referral process as well so that you're getting paid off of your, uh, you know, off of these transactions as well. We can make that happen. Yeah, I love that, dude. So, um, okay, so then now, though, I know that too recent, I don't want to say recent, it's been a couple of years now, but you've also, th- this has evolved from not just having a lot of success for, your, for yourself and for your clients, but now you've been able to take this and help this grow a real estate brokerage and then start leveraging to build up, using this to kind of leverage and help you build up your traditional business. So kind of walk us through like, like what you've done from that. You got this going on, now you open up your own brokerage, and then how are you tying this into, you know, because I look at those, you got 16 flips right now, it's 16 open house opportunities, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, seven days a week, um, you know, sign calls, uh, other lead sources, like how, how are you leveraging this? Because I know you also now have a very successful not just traditional business yourself, but a very successful brokerage in, in, in Vegas as well. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing is, you know, my partner and I have decided to, to, to sort of split and where he's managing the Paragon Asset Management Group and I'm managing Better Life Realty. There, yes, there's a lot of crossover, but the inventory that we get from our flips is actually fueling the opportunities for Better Life Realty and our agents. Um, and, and, you know, thanks to you, I got a lot of great ideas with marketing and, and things to do with the pro- properties that we have right now, you know, with Facebook ads and, and creating the leads and the opportunities for our agents. But it is definitely what's fueling behind uh, uh, Better Life Realty and the opportunities. But also, you know, building a, a next generation real estate brokerage is really where my mind is and where I want to go. There's so many agents out there that, have, you know, whether they've been in the business for a long time or they're just getting in the business, they really don't know how to, don't, a lot of them don't know where to go. And what I want to do is really create a step-by-step process for agents that come in with between from the onboarding to the training to the support to the, to the systems to accountability, just laying everything out so that when you come in the door, you know exactly what to do day one until, you know, and, and every year there, year after and, and continuing to help that business grow. And, you know, it's, it's really easier said than done. You know, you've been running a team for a long time. You know how that goes. Um, but yeah, I, I want to really create that platform for people to be able to thrive in. And and it's 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 taken. I, I've literally taken the last year and just been a student. I've been following you. I've been following other people. I've been in your in your boot camp and the mastery program. I can't thank you enough how much I've gotten from that. And I'm really designing a lot of my systems and tools from what you've given out as well. But it's 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 really just about those systems and about the training and the tools that you give those agents and and it, it's it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, and what I love about it too, you know, I, I think that people don't always, you know, it's like when people think about joining a brokerage or a team, uh, most realtors, their minds instantaneously go to splits. Never of you know the right question to always ask yourself is whom am I going to become from being a part of this environment. You know, right? And I would think for any realtor, like I would just, like if I was a brand new realtor, like what better dude to surround yourself with than you? Like, like you know the traditional game, right? You know the flip game. Like when people always ask me, um, you know, is it a good market? I'm like, that's an irrelevant question. The question is whom is it good for? It's always good. And a cat like you, like you know how to float, man. You know how to balance these out. so then, then you're always able to go out there and create that success. That's, that's awesome, dude. So, okay, so so with the traditional stuff, so you got the, these flips happening. You know, you're talking about leveraging these out for open houses. Um, you know, like what what are you doing in your traditional business that's that's really effective, that's working really well for you guys overall right now? Uh, Facebook, Facebook number one, open houses number two, and that's really all I've been focusing on. And I generate so many leads through Facebook 
that, you know, that you know, I'm a boutique brokerage right now. We only have five agents. So for me, I actually have to pull back on my, my lead generation because you flood the agents with too many leads and they don't, they don't effectively handle them. And for me, I spend a lot of, you know, a, a lot of time, resources and advertising dollars on, on paid Facebook ads, leveraging my current inventory to do that with leads. You know, I've, I've, I've gone through and, and, and tested a lot of different ways of generating leads on Facebook. And I found by far the best way for me to do that is my current inventory. You have a tangible property. You know, it's really hard when you're sending out like, you know, a lot of people just advertise a certain home or a certain type of home. And I found for me that that doesn't, it's not as effective as if I'm advertising a tangible property that I have listed now I can go out there and leverage that with Facebook ads and I get way more success with my leads, quality of leads, the amount of information that I'm getting. And, uh, you know, so I, so I pump a little bit of money into that, but it pays off huge. Yep. Yep. So, okay. So ju just to give us an idea, because people hear, you know, it's like, like people hear, oh, Facebook ads, you know, right? But there, there's, as you and I see, because again, we were in the same circles together, um, there's a lot of people like you can do it and do it right. And then you got a lot of people doing it wrong. Right. So, okay. So you got this and what's cool about your flip properties. Cause I, I, you know, I get, I see them, right. Not physically, but I see a lot of your photos and they're gorgeous properties. Right. So you got this gorgeous property that they're advertising. Like give us kind of a walk us like what a sample ad is. Cause people right now do their ears are perking, right? They're like, Holy shit. This guy's having the, this guy's having to shut down his lead gen. Cause he has too many leads coming in. Right. That's a problem that most people don't have. So kind of walk us through like, you got this great new flip property. How would you advertise it to get leads? I keep it as simple as I possibly can because the picture says everything with our flips. And that's the advantage of having these 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 flip properties to, to leverage off of as well because every one of them are turnkey and beautiful. I mean, we're doing we're trying to keep it fresh every time, you know, everybody started with the tile backsplashes in the kitchens and you know and and those were great for a while, but then they became a little too trendy. But now what we're doing is we're actually putting putting laminate wood on the on the walls as like an accent wall. We did a property just just recently was laminate wood on the ceiling. They had a big cathedral ceiling as you walked in. We had laminate wood floors on the ceilings. And you walk into these properties and it just blows people away. And so really that's I, I think that it doesn't matter what I put in the ad. I could just put a link in the ad and the picture is going to do, you know, do everything for me. So for me, I just keep it simple and saying, you know, you know, one, two, three, any street available at, at, at 250, click here for more info. And, and that's it, you know, just as, as simple as possible and not too gimmicky. I find when I get too, too wordy or too crazy with the wording, uh, you know, it, it's not as, as effective as if I just keep it simple. Yeah, I, I agree. Like if you if you study most copywriting classes, they tell you if it's really more than three sentences, the human mind gets shut off. As soon as they like see four sentences, dude, they're gone. You know, right? So okay, so then they they get this ad, they click this ad. Um, I mean, like, what do, what do you drive them to? Do you have a specialized website? Like, how, how do you get them to give you their information? Yeah, I, I'm subscribed to you to to Perfect Storm. Um, so I'm using the front and the back end of Perfect Storm allows me to create uh, landing pages for these ads the click on the link or the click on the photo of the of the property it sends them right into um our, our crm but then allows us to put them on the drips call them all that stuff and so that's that's how they come into our system yeah well so i don't think i've, I've had a chance to talk to you personally since you got this since you came out of the crm man is that working good for you Love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. You know, I get a lot of people calling me asking me, you know, how do you like the system and all that? And you guys keep sending them to me because I'll, I'll keep telling everybody that system is amazing. Yeah. The, the, we were on uh, um, uh, a big purple dot prior to going over to, to Perfect Storm. And I, I found big purple dot because you have to go through MailChimp with it. MailChimp, I think, gets picked up by a lot more filters than if it's coming directly from your, you know, from your, from your email. So when we switched over to Perfect Storm, our, our response rate went up by, you know, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but it feels like 300%. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it really, we started to get people calling us going and, and responding to our, our text messages or our, our emails or our, our phone calls. Like, who is this? You know, I mean, what do you mean? Who is this? I've been dripping you for a year now. What do you mean? Who is this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they're just finally starting to see us. And, and so I don't know what the difference was, but the difference was huge. Yeah. And my agents are noticing the difference as well. 
Well, I know that that was one big thing about us. That's why I like most these CRMs too, whether they're you know tied to like a Mailchimp or most of them will use like a Gmail, right? Um, and right. that's why we were so adamant about building our own email system. So you know, hopefully it eliminates a lot of that spam. And then too, like the scary thing I always have with. Like, let's say, you know, I won't name drop other CRMs out there, but that I've used in the past is like, okay, they're, they're getting free free emails through Gmail. What if Gmail just one day says, hey, guys, we're not going to give you free email anymore? Like, the, your whole operation is shut down at that point. You know, it becomes kind of scary. So, um, now, I love that. Dude, so, are you doing, um, just out of curiosity, do you need to do, like, like any type of, like, pre-marketing? Like, um, you know, like, I know on Perfect Storm, this is kind of a new thing, but we just had, like, the supplemental listings where you could pre-market. Do you do, and not get just, I, I don't want people watching this or listening to this thinking that this is, like, a Perfect Storm plug. Um, I, I, you know, obviously, know your client. I didn't know, though, that if you were using the site to actually advertise these on, on, on those in this specific manner. So, are you doing any type of, like, pre-marketing? Like, hey, coming soon, be the first person to see this or, you know, any type of that or is it pretty much just because you got so much going on once they're listed yeah i, I really try to have a, a system where i'm doing the same thing with every property where it's hey we got this one that's ready for marketing it's it's completed ready for marketing and then it gets handed over to me on the better life side and then i have my system where it's it's coming soon a facebook ad and then it's just listed just sold all that yeah, that's that's great in theory but again i'm having to pull back on the on the lead generation so a lot of times it's it's uh you know it's just the available ones that i'm doing you know Love but that. as i start to grow and as i start to ramp this up i definitely will be doing taking advantage of the pre-listing the listing and the just sold and just i mean i, I literally generated 600 leads a couple months ago just off of doing my my available properties on facebook yeah. five bucks a day <laughs> yeah, that is just crazy, man. I mean, we've been there too, where you gotta, you just gotta like, and I never thought I'd be there either. I never thought I'd get to a point where I had too many leads, where you right. gotta shut this. But it's just the reality of it, dude. You know, um, so I love that, man. So, um, like, what do you, what do you, do you have a vision of where you see yourself going with all this, right? Because like, you got the brokerage, you got your team, you got the like, like I, I got to imagine, uh, um, just the software that you guys have developed alone. You could probably figure out how to go out there and sell that to other investment companies and, and make some damn good money there too. Like, do you do you do you have kind of a vision of where you see yourself taking all this, or do you see yourself more drawn to one part of it more so than the other? That's a great question, and I, I'm still, you know, I, I really need to get clarity on that because I, I do have a vision, but I don't have that vision really mapped out. And that's really what I've been I've been trying to, to to really spend some time on over the last few months, you know. And as we go into the the new year in 2017, and writing my goals for 17, it's it's also looking at that five and ten year vision of of where do we see ourselves from? Because the auction platform is going to go away again, you know. We know that yeah. it's going to be something else, and it's going to be that you know it's it's all cyclical and it's it's just this. So where I really see the longevity in the future is in Better Life Realty and growing that into being a, um, a, a multi-market um, uh, real estate brokerage where we continue to grow that. At, uh, but again, I'm, I'm in no hurry to grow this real estate brokerage because I've been there. I've done that. My other businesses and being, you know, and, and trying to be everything to everyone, it doesn't work. So what I've done over, like I said, over the last year is just become a student. I want to learn everything that it takes to build this so that I have a solid foundation to build off of and build it from the ground up that way and not worrying about the growth yet, but worrying about the stability and the foundation. And then once we have that in place, then we start worrying. You know, that's, that's what I've been doing for the last year. 2017 is now going to be about production again. Now that we have that foundation in place, now I'm going to focus on production for 17 and then 18 will be our growth looking at expansion and, and, and um, you know, I, I, I also there's there's a lot of work that I need to do on recruiting. Um, I know that uh, John Chet Black is a real great guy for that. I'd probably look into maybe getting coached by him for a while. And, and but just right now, focusing on the foundation, focusing on the transaction count in 2017 and then looking at the recruiting and expansion phase of 2018. That's the near future for us. Yeah. No, I love it, man. I mean, it's one of those things where you, you can't push rope. And so many people just try to force things. And I think you're totally doing it right, dude. 100%, man. So, you know, you talked about your family, um, you know, behind you and, and your photos and, and really being your why, the driver, and the most important thing to you. Um, but, man, when you got all this going on, you know, like one of the hard things, I think, for drivers and entrepreneurs is, 
I hate the word balance, but trying to find that you know, where like, man, I got I to go drive 16 hours a day over here. Then I got to find time to work out. And I got to, you know, create time to invest with my family. Like, how, how do you keep it all together, dude? Because, you know, you definitely do a great job at it. And I don't want to say it's easy for anybody to do. But like, how do you create that that in your life so you're not neglecting something that's important to you? I just make it a priority. You know, make it a priority to to not neglect my business and make it a priority to not neglect my my family time as well. And then and I mean, present with your family when you're that, that was a really hard lesson for me to learn was was trying to be present with my family when I was with them, because I had so many things going on in my head and so many like I, I got to make so many decisions on a daily basis and, and the direction of things and this. And it's just so overwhelming at times that when I'm with my family, I'm not present. I'm gone. I'm, you know, I got this phone and I'm doing this and it's just, so I, I've just learned to, to, to realize that it's not a separation, but it's an awareness of when you're with your family, be with your family. Yeah. And when you're at work, be focused on work. And that's really, and that's, that's easier said than done, but that's what my mindset is. And that's what I try to focus on. And, and I have a great relationship with my kids and my wife. And, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed in that, that arena. I've got a lot of support from them and that, that really helps too, you know, and when you got everybody on the same page, knowing that, Hey, here's what the plan is. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of work, but you know, we're going to get there. Yeah. Love it, dude. Love it, man. So you talked about being a student several times, man, and and that's something that I wholeheartedly believe in as well. Like you gotta you gotta learn to be a student of the game, student of life, man. It never ends with that. Um, so so you got all this stuff going on. Just kind of like the family question. I mean, what does self development look like for you though? And again, I know that it, probably same thing. You make it a priority, um, you know. But again, that's something easy to get neglected, you know, right? It, yeah. it, 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 in, in our lives as well when we're this busy. Um, what does that look like for you? And how do you how important do you feel that is? And how do you um, integrate that into your life? Uh, it, it's been more important for me this last year than it has been in my entire life. I've met, read more books in the last 12 months than I have in my entire life. And that's through integration. You know, I mean, you teach it all the time. It's like just the things that you do on a normal basis that you don't have to think about. I put my earbuds in. I don't have time to, to actually open a book and read books. I do that sometimes when I'm when I have some downtime. But majority of the time, they're audio books. And I put them in. I get up at 330 put in my earbuds, get ready for the gym. I get to the gym at four o'clock, working out for about an hour, have my earbuds in. Um, so that's really my self-development time there. And a lot of times I'll try to, you know, when I get stressed out from a day's worth of work and I come home, uh, I try to take a walk around the neighborhood. You know, when I walk around the neighborhood, I decompress and I throw in my earbuds and, and you know, listen to you know, Grant Cardone or somebody gets me fired up and, you know, just really spending time doing the things that I already do. So integrating that into my, my daily routine is the way I get it in. And in the car, you know, car's the best part. Yeah. You know, do a lot of driving and checking on a lot of my properties and, you know, doing walkthroughs and things like that. So it's, uh, you know, a lot of drive time. So I get a lot of, a lot of audio books and driving. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So, um, you know, and those again of you that are watching this or listening to this, um, you know, make sure you definitely reach out to Brian. I mean, definitely follow him on Facebook because he's also uh, uh, always posting some of these cool rehab properties that they, they're, you know, doing and, and before and after picks, which is always, I think all of us that are in the real estate game just love to see um, with that. But, you know, I think one thing too, like I'll get people that are like, oh, dude, you know, I got these investors that are wanting to purchase in, you know, California. I can't find them anything that's above an 8% return on their money. You know, right? Well, if you guys are hearing this, it doesn't matter where you're at in the country. If you're a licensed real estate agent, anywhere in the country, if you have investors, but you can't get them what they're looking for in their area, it's like, dude, I, I know this cat that's in Vegas getting his clients 22%. Like Brian said, man, they'll take care of you and get you a referral and get you on the deal. And I mean, you've been at this game now for a decade, you know, right? So it's definitely got that track record. So make sure you guys take advantage of that because I think that that's absolutely critical, dude. So, um, all right. So the, the last question I have for you here is... In, in, it's kind of a question that you've already kind of answered today because you've had to reinvent yourself so many times. But if something happened today, right, um, and you got wiped out fully, completely, dude, um, family's good, health is good, but you you fully starting from scratch all over again. But you you retained everything that you've known from all the years of all these experiences. What would you immediately go do out there to rebuild your real estate business? Like what's like the, like the first two three things that you would do? between everything that you've ever done that you would immediately start doing to rebuild? I would do open houses and, and, and focus on Facebook. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, that's a simple question. It's, it really is. That's where the, you know, right now in this market, in this time right now, there's no better way to build your business right now than, than those two things. And, and you preach it every single day. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my answer is the exact same. People ask me that. <laughs> I get as I go, like, don't, don't. <laughs> yeah. Josh, if you had to move to a new city and start all over, would you? The exact same thing I'm doing today. I just wouldn't be able to do as much of it, but I do the exact same thing, which is just those two things, man. It, and what I love about, what's that? There's such a low cost, you know, uh, a way to build your business as well. And, you know, and getting in front of people on a regular basis, especially with the open houses. You're getting in front of, ready, willing, and able buyers the majority of the time. And there's no better way to get in front of people than in sitting in those open houses. And you, you see them. I mean, where the open houses have been, you know, exploding, you know, here in our market, I'm sure, you know, you know, yeah. Phoenix is, is pretty much the same as Vegas, but they're, they're everywhere now because people are realizing that it's, it's time to go back to basics and building your business that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been, uh, I'm going to my 12th year in the business and it's the only con like constant, like I, if I had a, if I only had one choice to do one thing, like it would definitely be open houses, right? Um, you know, it's been the one constant thing that's always proven itself for the you know over a decade I've been doing this for sure. So, all right, bro. So, um, you know, those that are watching, listening to this uh, podcast right now are, are here, dude, because they're students, right? They want to learn from uh, uh, dudes like you that are in the trenches that are building these epic businesses. Um, with that being said, man, any last uh, words of advice or inspiration you'd like to leave our listeners with so they can go out there and create? the amazing life that they know they truly want and deserve? Yeah, I, I just say never give up, man. It's hard. You know, every day I get up and go, man, today's, today's even harder than it was yesterday. But you know what? I'm ready for it. So just just never give up and knowing that, you know, the, the hamster wheel is always going to be there. Just don't go there. <laughs> you know, pick yourself up and, and start over again. And then and then find the people that are around you that, that are doing the things that you want to do or they're in the, in the place that you want to be and find a way to get involved with them, whether that's, you know, a lot of people ask me, how do I get involved in flips? And how do I find flips for my investors? And how do I find the money? And uh, you need to get involved with some people that are actually doing it. Not me, but somebody. Right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, just go out there. And, and even just if you wanted to, you know, to say, hey, I, I'll do some work for you for free. I just want to be involved in what you're doing. And, and that way you're going to earn the respect of those people and, and you're going to get into those systems and learn them. Um, and, and that's the best way to do it. Yeah, if somebody called you, today, let's say it's maybe, I don't know, a hungry, young, 21-year-old dude in Vegas that wants to get into the flip game. And if he called you up and said, hey, Brian, um, you know, I want to learn. I want to learn from you. You know, I don't have money to pay you, um, but I'll give you four hours of my life every day. Right to help you with property inspections, to to just learn the process for you to mentor me. I'll give you four hours of my life every day. Put me to work. Would you turn that person down? No, absolutely not. You know, yeah. I mean, it just and it shocks me how many people like aren't willing to go out there and 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 do that. You know, right? But I mean, it, there's always a way to learn. So I, I love it, brother. So powerful words, dude. And those of you watching, listen. I know in every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation truly is just the start of delusion. Information is not power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on that creates power in your world. So you guys just heard from an epic, amazing realtor today. Uh, um, like I said, you know, as you guys know from from just listening to Brian. I mean. 500 plus transactions, uh, uh, you know, in, the, is, is in a year. I mean, that's just, that's more than I've ever done. I mean, it's, it's insane to just think of that volume, dude, right? And it's reinvent himself over and over and over. This is a dude that knows what he's talking about, man. So take something that you learned today. Don't wait. Implement, take action on it, and keep kicking ass. And Brian, dude, I know how busy you are. I know it's a, a holiday week as well, man. So I know it's kind of cutting into family time, man. So truly, truly appreciate you being here, man. It's been a massive honor, brother. Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate you, man. I, I, I just I, I love being here and, and I love support and everything that you do. You've always given um, everything yourself and we appreciate everything that you do. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, truly means a lot, man. All right, you guys, we will see you next time.